Good afternoon, good morning, and welcome to the first webinar in the series of Climate Action Dialogues organized by ERIM for the Asia and the Pacific region after the Climate Change Conference COP27. My name is Yulia Dobralubova. I'm a partner at ERIM based in Bangkok, and I will be the moderator for today's first session. Uh, for those of you who may have not heard, COP27 is the climate change conference organized by the United Nations every year uh, to get together representatives from more than 190 countries to negotiate on the future of the climate agenda. And this has become a big event as well to get together non-state actors. And today we have a very interesting panel of speakers who will share with you key outcomes from the COP27 conference, the latest of which uh, has just finished in Egypt, Sharm el Sheikh, and also to share with you their perspectives on what it could mean for organizations and businesses in Asia. So this is our agenda for today. We'll start off with a very quick introduction. Uh, then uh, we will have a guest speaker from the UK, uh, our global sustainability lead, uh, Lyndon Angel, who will share her uh, insights from the COP27, which she attended in person. And then we have a very cool panel discussion with representatives from ERAM, uh, Asia and the Pacific regions. And lastly, we'll have the Q&A session, uh, picking up questions from the audience. But before we start, let us quickly go through the key housekeeping rules for today. Uh, first of all, we encourage active participation, and I know that we have a lot of participants today from different organizations uh, across Asia and the Pacific. So please feel free to post your questions in the Q&A chat box, which we'll be picking up during the session. Secondly, we'll be doing recording for today's event, which will be later on available at the RM APAC website, which you can access, download or share with your colleagues later. We also have enabled the English transcript feature, so you can simply click on the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen and select show subtitles. Lastly, uh, there will be a feedback form at the end of the webinar. We encourage you to share your thoughts and feedback on today's event, which will help us prepare the next sessions in this series uh, to meet better your requirements. Let's move on. And with this, we actually would like to know our audience as well. So there will be two questions in the pop-up window that you will see in a second in front of you. So the first question will be which sector your organization represents with some options available. And if you scroll down this pop-up window, you will see the second question, which will be, what is your take on COP27? And let's give you a few moments to answer both questions. I'm very curious to see what you think about the COP27, if you've heard already any updates. All right, let's have a look at the results. So in terms of the sectoral uh, spread, we actually have very wide diversity of the participants today, uh, coming from power and renewables, oil and gas, financial sectors, chemical, pharmaceutical, agribusiness, food, beverage, manufacturing, and uh, a wide group of other sectors. In terms of uh, results of COP27, um, the majority of respondents said uh, some success, but not enough to reach the 1.5 degrees target. Uh, a lot said disappointing. Uh, some said it's really hard to form a view and very few said success. Well, let's see what our guest speaker Lyndon uh, says. Uh, let me invite Lyndon to the floor. In, uh, very briefly, uh, Lyndon is ERIM's uh, Global Sustainability Director. She is actually leading our uh, company's relationships with some of the leading organizations like United Nations, Global Reporting Initiative, and World Business Council for Sustainable Development. And what's most importantly, Lyndon was actually there at COP27, and this negotiation process she has been following for uh, very long time so very looking forward to hearing her perspectives on things. Lyndon over to you what's your take on COP27? Thanks Yulia just making sure my sound is okay with everyone. 
Okay, great. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, depending where you are. Um, it's always hard when someone asks the question, you know, so how was COP or what is the takeaway of COP? Um, COP is, is, yes, it's the negotiations, but these days COP is also a conversation uh, with many voices. And this year in Sharm El Sheikh, indeed, there were many different voices. For the first time, children and young people had a pavilion. There was a pavilion for the just transition. Um, there were many people from business, from civil society, from academics, alongside the formal negotiations, all trying to push the implementation forward of what we need to do on the climate agenda. So let's give you a few perspectives. I don't promise to be able to really share the ins and outs of all the detail that would take hours, but let's give you some perspectives. You can go to the next slide, please. So we're trying to give you two, two sides of the coin. This is from a week ago, really, because COP finished um, just over a week ago in the, in the middle of the night in Sharm El Sheikh. On the left-hand side, we have Alok Sharma. Now, he was the president um, of COP26 in Glasgow last year. And he was very clear a year ago about getting in text around um, keeping to the 1.5 degree commitments of the Paris equation. You'll see there that he has set out a number of things that he believed were not in the final text, in the final negotiating text, and the concerns around that. So around emissions peaking, around through phasing down coal and, and other fossil fuels, um, and uh, what he termed a weakening of the text around energy supply. So he was quite scathing, and any of you saw this clip live in the final plenary sessions will see his disappointment um, and his frustration. But on the other side, on the other side of the coin, we have Antonio Guterres, who's the UN Secretary General, who was very clear to remind us that the progress made particularly on loss and damage, and we'll talk about that shortly, um, was all about trust, rebuilding trust in the system between um, countries who feel like they haven't had a voice for many years and the more developed nations. And so I think we just need to balance some of the frustrations with some of the hope, and that is always the, the, the situation with COPs. This is COP27, so the 27th meeting of the governments of the world. And I think it's always important that we, we think about the longer term, not just the short term. So if we go to the next slide, we'll see what um, Egypt as the COP president, so the host country becomes the president of the COP. What did they set out in what they termed the African COP or the implementation COP? They wanted to focus on mitigation, so that's reducing um, the emissions. Adaptation, which is how the world will adjust to a changing climate, which is already happening finance uh, and collaboration. So that was the four themes they brought to us. And, and let's just have a now look at each one of these in turn. If we go to the next slide, <clears throat> there was a term that appeared last year. We talked a lot about keeping 1.5 alive. So this is the commitment to a 1.5 degree future. This year that change to 1.5 degree is a limit, not a target. I mean, midway through COP this year, it's a, it's a two week event. There was some real concern that there'd be backsliding, that the watering down of the commitment to 1.5. So the business community came together, a number of leading business organizations around the world, and put a letter to the COP president um, and also the UN, uh, the head of the UN agency to say 1.5 is a limit and not a target. Now, ERM supported this letter. We were one of 250 businesses to do so and strongly lent our voice to really encouraging the governments of the world to maintain this commitment to emissions reductions. Because if we don't keep reducing the emissions and we don't keep the, the process going, then we are at severe risk. Um, we're at about 1.2 degrees now, so 1.5 degrees is foreseeable in the coming years um, based on all the current scenarios and forecasts. And the picture of a one degree world increased temperature, 1.5 degrees or two degrees, as you see on the diagrams here, means significant changes to the planet that we live on. And we are already seeing that um, through the floods in, in Pakistan and indeed Australia at the moment, um, bushfires, um, other extreme weather events. So 1.5 is very important. So mitigation 1.5, not enough progress at this COP. To the next slide around adaptation. Um, again, importantly, that this was the first time adaptation was really on the agenda. 
Uh, and I encourage you to take a look at the Asham al Sheikh adaptation agenda, which is a whole series of commitments from, from governments, from sub regional governments, from cities, from business, and from others, really looking at the investment that needs to go into adapting to this changing climate. Again, not enough money invested um, in terms of the financial mechanisms, but some real progress. So a, a semi okay on the report card. Moving along to loss and damage. Now, this is a particular terminology um, in, in the kind of um, COP world, but it largely refers to um, those who are most vulnerable, who are most impacted by climate change, didn't necessarily cause it in the first place, as in their economies haven't been burning fossil fuels for hundreds of years. So it's a, it's a type of compensation where, where the, the wealthier nations who've become rich off the back of burning fossil fuels for hundreds of years will effectively compensate those who are least developed. This has been a conversation for 30 years in the climate world, and this year there is finally a commitment to set up a fund. So not set up a fund yet, but a commitment to set up a fund and set up a committee to talk about this. So some really significant progress um, after a lot of fighting. On other climate finance, it's, it's still pretty limited, and so we need to, to really keep the pressure on to ensure that commitments to finance, public finance um, and private finance continue to flow. Next slide, please. In terms of business, um, I think there's some real push around accountability. We've, we've all heard about the greenwashing and I encourage you to take a look at two reports. One from the World Business Council of Sustainability on ambition, action and accountability. And one called Integrity Matters or known as the McKenna Report. And this came out um, commissioned by the UN Secretary General, setting out a very clear process where business and other non-state actors, so others other than the governments, um, are very clear and transparent about um, their accountability. So that's a very quick uh, walk through uh, the COP process. Now, Yulia, I'm going to welcome you back in to say that was a few of my perspectives. What's some of your thoughts about what happened at COP? Thank you very much, Lyndon. Well, I've been following the COP process actually since uh, 2005. Uh, my first COP was 2006. And what I can say since then, uh, COP has transformed from a purely negotiation gathering to a large international conference and event, even a fair trade in a way. And I would say like since a few last years, I've noticed a lot of attention and actions by non-state actors to the, to the extent that even the attention is shifting very much during COP weeks from what governments are doing to what non-state actors are doing. And from my personal view, they have been quite a lot of interesting statements uh, made during COP27 weeks. Um, made by the governments like uh, the new US package, for example, on energy transition accelerator. Um, there was an interesting uh, announcement by the government of Brazil, Indonesia, and the mm. Democratic Republic of Congo on preservation of forests, or the new initiative about uh, zero emission vehicles as per headed by the uh, UK and US governments, and as well as uh, some uh, interesting initiatives by the businesses. Um, the one event, for instance, I attended in particular was about the uh, zero emission uh, international shipment um, that was um, announced uh, by a coalition between the shipping companies and uh, green hydrogen producers, which I think is a very interesting case that may be later on picked up by other sectors. So these are probably my main uh, observations. And Lyndon, you've mentioned also quite a few interesting things. Uh, so what shortly would be the main positive shifts after the COP27 that you foresee to happen? As, as I said, it's sometimes it's important to look for the glimmers of hope rather than some of the, the gloom that you can see at a COP. I think there's a few things for me. I agree the collaboration, which of course was the fourth pillar of the COP presidency's desire was, was definitely there. Um, more business there than I've ever seen before, but lots of different people from business. So maybe people from procurement or carbon trading or risk or strategy, um, new business development, um, renewables. So lots of different people within big business organizations were there. So that was a positive. I think the real nexus emerging where people are realizing the intrinsic link between climate, nature and people. And, and we have to think of those thing, things together. So that nexus. I think for me, the other thing is mainstream attention. Um, you know, it was in the mainstream papers of the world pretty much over the two weeks when I returned back home, people were stopping me, my neighbors, my colleagues saying, okay, 
it's 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 very confusing just you know how can we understand what is going on there so people want to know people want to see what's happening there and i think the other one is the the reform of the multilateral development banks and the international financial institutions some real pressure to say the role of the world bank the ifc and other institutions has to change and has to work more with the private sector so there's some glimmers of hope i think so, All right. so, so that's the kind of global picture, but, but you have much better vision into Asia. What, what are you seeing in terms of the Asian perspective? Mm, yeah, that's a very good question. And uh, actually, Asia has always been quite active in the climate negotiations. And uh, this year is not an exception. Um, there were separate pavilions of individual Asian countries like Japan, South Korea, China. Um, I was uh, positively impressed to see pavilions also of new countries uh, like Singapore and Malaysia that uh, have presented their activities uh, at COP27 for the first time. And there were quite a lot of interesting events going on with uh, high level representatives uh, being present at, at these pavilions. Um, definitely Asia is in focus for various reasons. First of all, uh, the region still depends a lot on fossil fuels. And uh, for that, the topic of just transition, that was also one of the headliners for COP27, would be very important for us to, today for, for our region. And some of our panelists I know will be talking about this later. Secondly, we also produce a lot of goods and services for the rest of the world. And again, this brings attention from the global brands uh, to this region where they source a lot of materials and products. And uh, this is where the topic of climate change becomes very much linked to the topic of sustainable supply chains, uh, nature climate solutions and uh, uh, food, uh, sustainable food systems. So all of that, we'll touch upon today during our panel discussion. And um, let me see if we have any questions in the chat uh, for Lyndon uh, before we introduce our panel. Um, yes, we have one question. Uh, how could you translate the COP26 goals uh, in layman's terms for the common public? And is there a link that you would recommend for the reading? Wow, okay. Um, so COP26, uh, there were a number of agreements reached and you, you may remember lots and lots of announcements at COP26 about different initiatives, things like the global GFANS, the global financing initiative and others. Um, this COP, there weren't so many announcements and that was because I think people realized it was about implementation. And yes, some progress has been made this year, but I think people were a little bit um, nervous about pronouncing too many things because a it's hard to get things done in a year it's, it's, it's hard work um secondly i think there's this kind of accusation of greenwashing and people were quite concerned about not coming out with things until until too much was there so i think that's why it might have seemed a little bit more subdued from the announcements perspective but certainly where we were on the ground there are lots of different things happening and so i think we need to take encouragement about that um, in terms of sources of where to go, um, from a business perspective, I would go to the website of We Mean Business, um, which is one of the coalitions. I think that's very good and has good synopsis. Um, I would also go to the website of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development um, and the various Asian uh, member networks, I think, is two good places to start. And, and you'll certainly find other information from there. Thank you very much, Lyndon. And another question that a lot of clients of ours uh, keep on asking what would be the future of the carbon market um, as the outcome of this COP27. Any big changes that you may expect? Uh, well, if I had a crystal ball to know the answer to that <laughs> question, I think I, uh, I'd be retired. But um, there were a couple of important things, I think, to note. Um, the voluntary carbon markets, um, and we, had, we played quite a role in, in thinking about that, and particularly around natural climate solutions. Um, I think we will see at the moment, they're largely unregulated um, and there's a lot of concern about what is happening there. So this push to have high integrity credits, um, IOSCO, which is a sort of the global regulator of, of, of markets, is going to take a look at the voluntary carbon market. So I think we'll see a lot more rigour coming into the voluntary carbon markets. So that's, that's on that side. On the compulsory carbon markets, I think there's still a real push to bring in some form of carbon pricing that is still seen by many as the action that would get the most traction and actually progress things more than anything. So um, there's still a push around that. It's, it's slow, but, but I think we, we will see that. The other thing I would encourage business to do is to really get their head around carbon markets now. Um, as we head to 2030, and in, you know, I think about a third of the world's largest companies have net zero commitments. 
many of them have an initial target around 2030. Um, because we're not de decarbonizing fast enough, many people will be looking to access the carbon markets to, to meet that shortfall of, of residual emissions. And, and so the price will escalate because there is not enough on the supply side. So I would say get yourselves organized starting now uh, and talk to my colleagues about how you can do that. All right, thank you very much, Lyndon. Uh, please don't go. Uh, we will still have another slot for Q&A uh, session later on today. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, let me introduce to you our panel of um, Asia and the Pacific experts from UIM who will uh, talk about their perspectives on COP and what to expect from organizations and businesses in Asia and the Pacific. Uh, we'll have today with us Christopher Bray, uh, who is coming from Australia and New Zealand, Principal Consultant at IRM, leading Corporate Sustainability and Climate Change topic in this uh, part of Asia and the Pacific. We'll also have Sina Dabral, um, uh, who is um, Consulting Director based in Singapore, and she will represent South and Southeast Asia region today. The last but not the least, we also have Summer Chen, who is coming from Central East Asia region. And she actually herself was also at COP27 on the ground. So this is our panel. And I will start off with the first question for all of you. So after hearing uh, what uh, Lyndon said and obviously following up uh, on COP27, what are your takes in terms of the uh, next priorities for businesses and organizations in our region? And in particular, what you foresee as the next trends in terms of regulatory updates, as well as in terms of uh, what businesses need to prepare for. All right, let us start. Uh, and I would like to pass it to Sina first. Thank you, Ilya, and uh, good afternoon, morning to all who are attending. All right, uh, to, so to answer your question, so given the geographical location of the South and uh, East Asia, Southeast Asian countries, this region does have a major responsibility to reduce its increasing vulnerability to climate change. Hence, um, hence for South and East Asia, COP27 focused on scaling up adaptation solutions and mobilizing access to financing for adaptation. Um, the key takeaway take away from the summit, as we all know, has been um, establishment of the loss and damage fund. And uh, this has a direct applicability to the South and East Asia region. Um, although details, you know, such as who will pay into the fund and how much they will contribute is all unclear. Uh, but these adaptation funds could potentially be used for the onset of climate impacts, like uh, building a new infrastructure, early warning signs. Hence, um, I would say that it's important for organizations and industries in our region to understand and be aware of their climate related physical risks from, from uh, extreme weather events. Um, climate risks have also been the emphasis of stock exchanges and banks in the region and hence it will sort of only continue to gain more focus. Uh, actually to support this, um, the ASEAN Joint Committee uh, joint, joint Statement on Climate Change, which was uh, finalized following COP27, it stresses the need for developing countries to analyze climate risks, um, to formulate and implement adaptation measures. Hence, I would say a huge, huge emphasis on climate risk for, uh, for organizations in this region. Um, secondly, uh, the, nature, the Center for uh, Nature-Based Climate Solution in Singapore, uh, many of you would know this, launched a 15 million SGD research program to improve uh, credibility of nature-based carbon projects in Southeast Asia. So this is, uh, you know, a network of forest carbon monitoring plots which will be established. And uh, this is really good proof that demand for nature-based carbon credits is increasing with, uh, with more and more companies looking to buying offsets. Um, hence, what this research effort in a way will do is give investors greater confidence in the quality of uh, nature-based carbon projects. Um, I would really think this is the perfect uh, time for organizations to relook into their net zero commitments. You know, I already have a roadmap in place or strategy in place, including options for offsetting and nature-based carbon credits. Um, the demand is quite high for our region. Um, again, call from ASEAN uh, Joint Committee to strengthen adaptation efforts by uh, by implementing nature-based solutions and ecosystem-based solutions. So we'll see a lot of that uh, coming up in the next few months. Um, and uh, thirdly, very relevant to this region is um, 
lack of updates uh, during COP27 on phasing down fossil fuel. We all know that. Uh, but having said that, within the within the ASEAN joint statement, the countries uh, for our region have committed to submitting their uh, revised NDCs in 2022, which means that energy companies would need to be prepared for what comes next in terms of aligning to their, you know, the specific country NDCs um, in which they operate out of. So a lot, a lot to go on, Yulia, in terms of uh, what's happening, but I'll pause there. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much, Sina. Uh, let's ask other regions as well uh, what they think. Uh, Summer, would you mind picking it up for Central and East Asia and potentially North Asia if you uh, hear any updates? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Julia. Happy to. Um, so I, I, I joined COP um, in person and based on my observation, I think two topics really stand out in the discussions throughout the entire COP that might have implications for Central East Asia and North Asia. Uh, one is gas and one is carbon market. So for gas, because gas has become kind of a huge demand for, um, for them, it, it's the highest in Asia, I think, and Asia will be responsible for probably 60% of the new gas consumption going forward. So many attendees actually at the COP questioned if gas, um, if its role as transition fuel uh, might be changed. Um, they want it, it might be short-lived or less stable than expected, which really bring questions for owner gas company, like how do they transit smoothly and how do they uh, invest renewables and keep the existing infrastructure at the same time. So this is something we actually helped with companies before to kind of optimize the decarbonization solutions to reach net zero risk integrity. So for carbon market, because it's always been a hot topic since a long time ago, and regardless of disappointment or disagreements, skepticism like toward implementing the article uh, 6.4, which is kind of under the Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. It's about kind of setting up a supervisory mechanism to support the valid carbon market. But I do see kind of a lot of global efforts trying to incentive or spur the whole international emission trading. It's a large volume. So for example, Japan, Japan launched its Article 6 implementation partnership, and that attracts more than 60 countries. And they want to build a platform to exchange knowledge, experience on carbon markets. And also China, because given its ongoing carbon market, uh, ETS, emission trading scheme, it's trying to boost the supply of offsets in its national carbon market through using international carbon credits generated under also Article 6. So Hong Kong, for example, this is something launched before COP27. Um, they launched something called Core Climate. It's an international carbon marketplace designed to allow for the trading of voluntary carbon credits. And the market, the global market for voluntary carbon markets is back to reach 50 billion US dollars by 2060. So that's quite huge. And some companies see it as an opportunity, but some others see it as risks. So we would suggest company to kind of set up an internal carbon price and to conduct scenario analysis against the carbon price, ranging from US USD dollars 7 to 70, which is around 50 to 500 RMB. So that's something we would recommend company to do, just given the whole carbon market, the volume of it and the impact to the company business and supply chain. One last key takeaways from me is on adaptation, because this is one of the new focus and priority for Corp this year. And they've been talking about uh, ambition to kind of developing a financing vehicles for climate adaptation, not just for countries, but also for industries to how to scale up their ability to ad advance climate risk reduction. And one of the main problems there is whether there's there's a major lack of climate data necessary to assess like what the actual adaptation needs to be, how much that might cost to meet those adaptation challenges. So I didn't support many physical climate risk data providers at COP, but it, it was to mention that our ERM, we have an in-house physical climate uh, risk assessment tool, which called CRISP. Some of you probably already see a demo uh, that can potentially fill some of the data gaps, starting from um, assessing how the specific climate hazards would change in the future on the different scenarios, different time zones, and how that might affect the design, different adaptation measures um, to adapt to the climate risk. So we would suggest companies, um, for is that it, particularly for uh, infrastructures sector or real estate financial institution to start thinking about conducting climate risk assessment and stress testing their assets or the portfolio company you invested um, to meet those challenges. So I will stop here. I'll hand over to um, Chris. 
Thank you very much, Sama. Actually, what Sama has mentioned would be very important for other parts of Asia and the Pacific because we have a lot of investments and connections with China, Japan, South Korea across the whole region. So whatever is in trend in, in your part of our bigger region would be definitely important for the rest of our countries, if not for the globe. All right, with that, I will pass it on to Chris. Actually, we don't have that many uh, countries from the developed country camp uh, in this part of the world. So Chris is coming from Australia. It would be very interesting to hear his perspectives on the outcomes of COP. Thanks, Yulia. So to, to take a, a sort of an Australia and New Zealand focused view, um, without wanting to be too pessimistic, I don't think the new, the new multilateral decisions made by national governments at COP will have a notable impact on economic activity um, in our region, at least in the immediate term. But I do think there have been some quite interesting developments that occurred on the sidelines of COP and prior to COP. Um, so the reason I don't think the, the main Shamal Sheikh implementation plan is likely to have a, a really big immediate impact is that um, the level of climate change mitigation ambition embedded within the plan hasn't changed from Glasgow. And be because Australia and New Zealand both submitted updated NDCs, you know, which, which we've increased ambition in the last two years, I think um, a lot of those emissions reductions are already starting to be baked into regulation anyway. So I don't think we'll see a dramatic change there. Um, similarly, I think the uh, commitment to loss and damage funding is certainly interesting. Um, and that, that may have an impact on the way international aid is directed from both countries. Um, but I think we, we won't really know too much about the specifics of that until those funding mechanisms are agreed and documented. Um, but I guess to, to cut a slightly more, um, I guess, positive <laughs> note, um, there were a couple of things which I think may have uh, a notable impact on business. Um, and those were some of the um, agreements and pledges made by non-state actors um, in and around COP. So I think Yulia mentioned previously there was, there was a joint statement on green hydrogen and, and green shipping, um, which was, uh, I guess, agreed upon by a series of shipping companies and hydrogen project developers. So I think that's quite exciting um, as a potential signal that there may be a market emerging for green hydrogen. And Australia in particular does have ample solar resources, lots of land, and certainly lots of expertise in terms of, you know, compressing gas and putting it on boats. So that could be a sign of simply more activity in that sector in, in the very near future, which, which I think is fantastic. Um, in terms of some of the other pledges, um, I note that Australia did join the Global Methane Pledge just prior to COP. Um, so that, that was interesting in that it, it commits the nation to reducing methane emissions by at least 30% from 2020 levels by 2030. Um, the reason that's interesting is that it's, it's actually a hard emissions reduction commitment as opposed to being an emissions neutrality commitment. Um, so therefore it doesn't specifically include offsets. Um, and I think from what we've seen, I think we can probably infer that the Commonwealth in Australia is expecting um, the majority of those reductions to come from facilities already covered by the safeguard mechanism. Um, so ultimately, I'd suggest any, any organisations that are operating safeguard covered facilities, um, they're probably already paying a lot of attention to developments in that sector. Um, but I'd suggest you keep paying attention to it in light of that global methane pledge. Um, and then I guess just before I go, the final thing I wanted to touch on was with the changes to Article 6. Again, I'm, I haven't seen too much of the detail around how um, a potential international carbon market will be created. Um, but, you know, in principle, um, the presence of an international carbon market does have the capacity to dramatically boost activity in Australia's domestic carbon offset market. Um, the reason being, I mean, we, we have uh, a relatively mature and I would consider a, a quite high integrity domestic offset market. And when you consider the, the vast amounts of land mass available within Australia, it, it does give the nation something of a natural advantage with respect to the production of carbon offsets. So whilst historically, I think the Commonwealth has been quite protectionist um, with respect to the sale of um, you know, Australian developed offsets to other national governments, I think if that starts to liberalise a bit, it, it could really you know, lead to a big step change in the carbon price locally. Um, so I'll probably 
pause there and hand back to yourself, Julia. All right, thank you very much, Chris. And while we have you there, um, as Lyndon mentioned, just transition was a very big topic uh, during this COP. And we know that this is also a very sensitive but important topic for Australia, given a lot of dependence on coal of your economy. Can you give us any good examples from your experience or from your client's experience, how companies in Australia are already managing this uh, just transition topic? Certainly, certainly. So I guess to begin with, it's probably best to think about it generically. And I think at a, at a really broad level, um, a straightforward way for organisations to contribute to a just transition is simply to think about the social impacts of your low carbon transition plans. Now, in, in 2022, I mean, I, I think a low carbon transition plan is basically a synonym for a business strategy. So, I mean, in that sense, um, an organisation can contribute to that just, just transition by simply um, considering the ethics of those business strategies. And I'd also suggest that, uh, you know, a, a good approach would really involve taking a broad view of that social impact. So thinking about the social impacts across the organization's value chain. So instead of just limiting it to, the, to your direct employees, also thinking about suppliers, customers, and also the communities in which the organization operates. Um, so to, to kind of highlight areas of good practice, um, one of our clients um, operates a series of coal mining operations in Eastern Australia. And I personally think they've um, done what I would consider to be a really proactive and um, you know, high integrity approach to, to, to mine closure. So for context, um, it's, it's a, a global firm which, oper which uh, a, subsidiary, a subsidiary of which operates these Australian coal mines. Now at the global level, this firm recently committed to quite an aggressive um, Paris aligned emissions reduction trajectory, um, which, which ultimately has led to the accelerated closure timeline of, of, of a mine um, quite, quite, quite close to Sydney where I am actually. Um, and that mine has actually been operating in the same area, well, obviously in the same area for, for over a hundred years, um, meaning that it is quite, you know, it's, it's quite a sort of cornerstone part of the economy in that region. Um, so, so to, to me, I, I think the organization did, did three things really well in managing that transition. Um, firstly, they were really transparent. Um, so they ultimately gave both the mine employees and the community lots and lots of forewarning about when they were planning to stop operating the mine to give everyone like a, a really long lead time to prepare for this change. The second thing they did well is they repurposed the site to ultimately stir up more economic activity locally um, to, to ultimately replace some of what was lost by closing the mine. So in this instance, it was a coal mine, which was uh, which is in the process of being turned into a renewable energy hub. Um, so there are like, really large scale solar PV installations um, being established as well as, as, as well as a really large battery project and uh, a pumped hydro facility as well. And I think the final thing which, which they did really well was they partnered um, across both other complementary industries and with government itself. And what that enabled them to do was to both get access to additional capability to enable the project to be realized, which is great, um, but it also enabled them to have what I would consider a deeper engagement with some of the stakeholders in the area. Um, and I think today it's been quite successful. All right, thank you very much, Chris. A very interesting case study. Um, and before I pass the next question to Samar, I would like to encourage all of our participants to post your questions in the chat because we will announce a Q&A session very soon. All right, Samar, when we talk about uh, just transition or low carbon energy transition in general, it cannot be done without uh, new technologies. Uh, What's your take there and what were the key topics that have been discussed at COP27 in this regard? Thanks, Yulia. 
Yeah, so people know me knows uh, hydrogen is something always close to my heart. So I paid extra attention when I was there. I joined the hydrogen transition summit in the first week, and I do saw like widespread support in terms of its role in the transition to a net zero economy. So there's no discussion about, no question about whether hydrogen is a hype or not. Uh, everyone been discussing how to reduce the cost and what's the role in the power system or what's the role in hard to base sectors. So for example, attendees they saw kind of saw hydrogen as a potential replacement for gas. And some LNG companies, I noticed like in Japan and South Korea, they indicated that they are actually evolving and transition towards using hydrogen in their power system as they move away from coal-fired power generation. So for example, Mitsubishi, um, they are talking about I think, making hydrogen use gas turbine to kind of de decarbonize the whole power system. And that is likely to balance the power supply and demand with 80% um, of variable renewables. So that figure used to be around probably 40%, 50% five years ago, but now they, with the change of the gas turbines using hydrogen, they can actually increase the integration of renewables. And also another breakthrough would be kind of the, 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 the hydrogen's role in hard to base sector. We've been talking this for a long time, aviation, shipping, steel, cement, chemicals, there are loads of sectors, heavy industry, and they are now convinced that they can get to net zero by 2050. And part of the reduction, emission reduction, 95% of the emission reduction will be coming from inside, which means it's coming from the production process. So rather than buying the carbon offsets to, to balance out, right? So, so that, that's kind of, that's good. They're playing a key role. But how about the cost reduction? So the cost reduction, especially for producing green hydrogen. So for people who didn't know green hydrogen is, is hydrogen um, from uh, renewable electricity produced from renewable electricity. So it's purely uh, green. And that cost will be dropped down dramatically and through the reduced cost because the reduced cost for electrolysis and renewables. But how cheap would that be? That's a question. And I, I heard a, uh, someone talk about India's um, um, a person called uh, Mukesh Shabani. So he is the um, Asia's probably the richest guy, and he's building a gigafactory in India. And he said he aims to produce green hydrogen for under one US dollars per kilogram by 2030. I'm not entirely sure like whether that can be that cheap, like one US dollars. But what I do know is, I think the threshold will be around two US dollars per kilogram. That will be a key threshold. And if you below that price for the green hydrogen production, then you can, the, the, the product will become economic competitive for sure. So now we are convinced hydrogen is row in power sector, how to bait sectors, and the supply is growing from 1 million tons per year to probably somewhere around 800 million per ton, uh, per, uh, tons per year. And supply cost is dramatically falling down. So what, what's the problem now? The problem actually they've been talking about is how to boost the demand side to keep the pace of the supply so that they can formulate a dynamic hydrogen supply chain. So either it's bilateral, multilateral, there should be a dy dynamic with balanced demand and um, supply. And currently I think the supply side we can see it's growing and see the cost falling down, but demand side just doesn't really keep pace. So that's the problem. And that would require regulations from governments, of course. And they, uh, so regions have in incentive support policies will be ahead of the game. Saudi Arabia, they're targeting Asia in kind of the go global hydrogen push. Australia definitely position itself as a hydrogen exporter. China, Japan also announced the hydrogen strategies until like 2035. And for companies that also require companies to kind of set up its strategy, whether it's for investment strategy or deployment of hydrogen um, to enable it play a role that will it needs to play in your company's decarbonization journey. So I think that's kind of my takeaways from the whole hydrogen discussion at Corp, uh, which might be beneficial for sure. Um, provide some insights for companies here. Thank you very much, Sam. I fully agree that uh, green hydrogen as well as carbon capture utilization storage would probably become uh, big topics for us here in Asia and the Pacific going forward. All right, we talked about technologies, but we cannot make it happen without finance as well. So a question to Sina, how do you see uh, the uh, activities by the financial sector going forward? Any new uh, pressure points we need to expect? Uh, and there was also one question from the audience, uh, from Andradi, in terms of the blended finance. What is this and whether you see the increased interest to this uh, kind of scheme going forward? Sure, and thanks for the question, Indy. Uh, so, so the summit in Egypt was in fact called um, a finance COP, uh, 
not because of the actual financial commitments made, uh, which were generally modest, I would say, but because it underlined the fact that finance is the most important factor towards uh, transitioning on our climate ambitions. Um, so quite a few things happening, uh, which will be useful for the region. Uh, first and foremost, ADB's energy transition mechanism program to retire uh, existing coal-fired power plants and to replace them with uh, clean power capacity has kicked off. So this will accelerate uh, Southeast Asia's shift to renewable energy. Um, there was a push uh, during COP27 that the finance sector needs to finance actual emissions, uh, emission reduction funds, uh, rather than simply having you know, nominal targets for decarbonization. So uh, I would say a huge opportunity for climate tech funds and the need for climate impact frameworks for, uh, for investors. Um, in terms of commercial banks and private equity space, um, it was pointed out that there has been a low but steady progress by banks on the interim sectors for uh, for net zero. So with more and more banks now committing to net zero, uh, companies would need to prepare for their own uh, net zero targets because um, they are scope three for financial institutions um, and they would that would affect the portfolio of the financial institutions. So we expect scope three to ramp up. Um, other than that, uh, we, we read that wealthy nations have promised at least 20 billion in funding to help Indonesia. So uh, that is transitioning to clean energy. There will be a call for fossil based industries to take action. And um, and uh, it's, it's understood that similar projects are expected to be on the way for Vietnam and India. Again, um, ASEAN joint climate on uh, joint statement on uh, climate change. They call for finalizing development of ASEAN. Uh, ASEAN taxonomy for sustainable finance. Uh, this has been sort of in the discussion for uh, for some time, uh, but it's um, you know proposed to be finalized soon. And this is really key. Uh, this is key for a consistent and credible approach for uh, regional investors, which we will see uh, implemented quite soon. So uh, a, quite a scale up of investments towards, I would say, climate resilient infrastructure, renewable energy, uh, green alternative solutions such as hydrogen. Um, um, energy efficient devices, uh, carbon capture, circular economy, which will all get uh, get focus from the investors. Um, on your question on uh, blended finance, so really blended finance is strategic use of um, developmental finance for mobilization of additional money towards uh, sustainable development in 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 um, developing countries. So what that means is that. Uh, the funds, that, uh, the uh, finance that is available from ADB uh, on the ETS, that would count as a good step. Also on a more concrete step, um, ADB has actually uh, raised its ambition for climate change financing from 2030. Uh, it used, it was 80 billion. Now they have increased it to 100 billion out of which 34 billion is actually marked for adaptation. So that's again a huge step in sort of uh, uh, mobilizing that sort of uh, finance towards uh, developing countries. Thank All you. Right. Thank you very much, Sina. <laughs> and before I invite Lyndon for our Q&A session, um, I would like to reiterate, first of all, that Asia and the Pacific will be under spotlight in the coming year for various reasons. First of all, there will be COP28 in the United Arab Emirates uh, next December. Secondly, there will be India hosting a G20 summit and Japan hosting G7 summit. So obviously there will be a lot of uh, preparatory meetings uh, happening in our part of the world and Asia as the region and Asia in the Pacific broader would be definitely under attention and the topics that are relevant for our region. All right, there is also one more polling question for the audience. Uh, what are the climate actions that you are currently taking on a plan to take on in the next six months. And there are an array of options, uh, also linking back to some of the topics that our panelists and Lyndon have mentioned today. Let's wait a few moments and see what the majority are doing or planning to do next. Okay, let's take a look at the result. Excellent. Um, all right, interesting um, 
options. So first of all, net zero decarbonization strategies, uh, the majority of respondents said so. Uh, then followed up by scope three, greenhouse gas emissions accounting. And I know there is a burning question on that, uh, waiting for the panel. Uh, more in-depth climate risk assessment and TCFD online disclosures. And uh, a little bit of everything else, uh, ranging from feasibility studies for low carbon technologies, nature climate solutions, social impacts of transition, and so on. Well, thank you very much. That's definitely helpful for us also to understand what's next on your agenda. And with that, let me start our panel and uh, invite Lyndon as well, because there, there will be some questions also on the global perspective. Let us start with the first question, which will be for Sina, um, more specific to South and Southeast Asia. What are the main concerns for Malaysia and Singapore, or what kind of initiatives, initiatives they are willing to take? All right. Um, so uh, with it, during COP, COP27, Singapore has um, updated climate commitments, uh, principally on strengthening its long-term plan to achieve net zero carbon emissions by 2050 and uh, reducing emissions to 60 million tons by the end of this decade. And that's that's quite huge. And uh, for that, they, are, they have mentioned uh, improvement and development of decarbonization technologies. Uh, hydrogen has been a, a, a huge focus. In fact, um, in fact, looking at hydrogen has been announced way before uh, COP27 a couple of weeks ago in one of the conferences. Uh, they're all, they've also emphasized for uh, international cooperation to collaborate on, um, on adapting these uh, decarbonization, uh, decarbonization technologies. Um, I, I, I did also read that Singapore has joined several coalitions during the summit to strengthen um, action on issues including forest and land, carbon markets, um, green shipping, water security, and earlier I mentioned about um, uh, the the fund that has been uh, that has been introduced for uh, for a carbon market. Um, there there was also an emphasis on boosting uh, food resilience through innovative uh, production technologies in a way that's uh, that fits into the uh, into the climate uh, mitigation adaptation sort of solutions um malaysia malaysia is to focus more on adaptation on uh, climate finance and um actually a lot on local solutions, on being locally sustainable. Um, during COP27, Malaysia did have um, quite a few discussion on sustainable finance, um, and these were uh, these were led mostly by uh, Bank Negara, uh, Negara Bursa Malaysia, and uh, financial institutions in Malaysia. Uh, and I think this is apt given their latest focus on uh, climate related financial risks and you know the ask to align to TCFD and uh, so on and so forth. So I would say uh, the finance sector was mostly uh, one of uh, Malaysia's biggest initiatives. Um, in terms of updating NDCs, Malaysia did update their NDC last year um, to be 45% by 2030, which was at the time quite uh, quite good for Malaysia. So um, they have now given an option to revise the NDCs every every five years. Hope that answers that question. All right, thank you very much, Sina. Next question will be for Chris. Um, we talked today about decarbonization options for scope one, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, what would be the solutions to reduce scope two? Uh, emissions as well. And maybe Chris, if you don't mind, uh, for those who don't know, please kindly remind what Scope 2 is. Okay, so the first primer on Scope 1, Scope 2 and Scope 3 emissions are, in general terms, Scope 1 emissions are emissions which you create yourself through your direct activities. So in the case of a business, that might be things like, you know, driving cars around or, um, you know, burning, burning fuel in your factory. Scope two emissions are indirect emissions that occur as a consequence of your business activity. So the classic things there are emissions associated with the consumption of electricity by yourself um, or the consumption of steam from an offsite source. Um, and then finally, scope three emissions are indirect emissions associated with your business activities, which aren't from electricity or steam. So things like that might, might include things like um, emissions from business travel or it, it, there are there's there's quite a complex taxonomy of scope three emissions but I, I think just thinking about them as emissions that are sort of occur as a consequence of your activity but they're, but they're very much external to it now 
Um, in terms of the first question, which was how to reduce scope two emissions, the really basic answer is use electricity and gas more effectively. Um, so become more efficient at it. Um, now, that might include things like um, just doing a series of energy audits and finding um, more effective ways to deliver the same amount of output of, for by using less electricity. Or it could also include things like um, generating your own electricity through the use of distributed renewable energy systems like, like solar panels. Um, yeah, so, 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 so those like in, in really generic terms, that's how to do it. Um, but ultimately, the solutions um, which you'll need to arrive at are ultimately going to be very specific to the use case. All right, thank you very much, Chris. And a, que a follow-up question to you and maybe for other panelists who would like to add uh, is about scope three greenhouse gas emissions. And if there are any tools that can help monitor uh, greenhouse gas emissions, especially related to your supply chain. This is like, I do, I do a lot of emissions accounting work, but I don't do much scope three work. So the, the scope three emissions accounting that I've been exposed to has been they've been quite deep technical exercises involving firstly identifying which sources are relevant and then going through quite manual process of cap and processes of calculating them um, but i guess i'd be interested to hear from the other panelists as to whether there are any tools which we have or that we've seen being used that could be effective for this yeah and in, in, in terms of tools i guess uh, i guess there's an online tool which is called scope 3 evaluator which is uh, which is really a tool from a greenhouse gas protocol, which is the internationally recognized um, guidance document for calculating scope three emissions. Uh, I believe that's that's one of the, you know, sort of free recommended uh, scope three tools available. There are quite a few out there by various companies, uh, but at least this is something which I know is more uh, more reliable. Um, I might just add to it, there are definitely more products coming into the market, um, which effectively attach themselves to your inventory, um, your accounting for, so to move from, from spend data to actual data. So there's certainly more coming onto the market and, and you can find those. Yeah, and I would like to add that generally at this COP27, there were a lot of discussions about how to assess COP3 emissions, especially for financial sector. And that in turn would definitely impact uh, all the companies uh, who have investors or lenders. So uh, their scope of emissions essentially are your scope one and two emissions that would need to be tracked going forward. So definitely a lot of things will move in this direction going forward. Very last question, uh, being mindful of time, uh, to you, Lyndon. Um, we talked today a bit about the interconnections between uh, nature, climate, and sustainable food systems. And we know that there is another COP coming uh, already soon in December, which is COP15 for the Biodiversity Convention. Could you tell us a little bit more about this and how you see this nexus uh, developing going forward? Yes, yeah, so next week in, in Montreal in Canada will be uh, COP15, which is sort of the biodiversity COP is the shorthand way. Um, it's, it's hosted by China, actually, but, um, but has been delayed because of COVID, um, but will be, be situated in, in Canada. Um, it's, it's being equated to the sort of the Paris uh, COP uh, for climate in that there, there is uh, ambition to have a global, uh, global framework on biodiversity. And that's going to be really important because the, we don't have really a 1.5 equivalent for nature. Um, and it's, it's complex and it's diverse. So that's the kind of first task is to see if we can get something that, that in the minds of people is the equivalent of the 1.5. Um, but of course, there's so many interconnections between nature um, and climate. I'm sure that we'll see a lot of conversation going on about those two um, and, and what we need to do to make sure we actually preserve biodiversity through reducing our emissions. So um, watch this space um, we will have colleagues there ERM will be um, will be broadcasting from there and, and having other publications come out in the next couple of weeks to help you understand um, how you think about nature in your business alongside climate they really need to be considered together with people of course
Thank you very much, Lyndon. And this brings us to the next slide, an announcement of the follow-up discussions uh, later this week. There will be dedicated climate action dialogues on such topics as just transition, digital and nature-based solutions, as well as climate finance and renewables. Please follow up, join us for the next sessions, which will run all the way till 5th of December, where we will deep dive into the specific subtopics of climate change. And I would like to thank all our panelists and speakers today, all of you who attended us and uh, listened to us and for your questions as well. And if you don't mind, please leave your feedback using this QR code. That will be definitely helpful to us uh, to organize next sessions for you. Thank you very much. It was our pleasure to be with you today and hope to see you at other sessions.